Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is a Friday Reads for four completed books and two currently reading. So the books I finished, My Tender Matador by Pedro Lemebel, which was recommended to me by Roxy over at uh, the Chaotic Bibliophile. Will Eves, The Absent Therapist, which I think was shortlisted for the Republic of Consciousness Prize or the Goldsmith Prize. Uh, when it came out, 2014 Goldsmith Prize. Passages by Anne Quinn. And finally, Ewan Morrison, How to Survive Everything. Uh, when did this come out? Yeah, it came out this year because it's, a, it's a, an epidemic narrative. OK, well, I'm going to start with The Best of the Bunch, uh, My Tender Matador by Pedro Le Mabel. Uh, I have to say uh, this was a fantastic translation by Catherine uh, Silva. So uh, the, the Queen of the Corner is a 40 plus uh, something uh, gay man who has false teeth. His hair is receded into just three clumps on his head. So he's definitely uh, aware of his sort of failing... Uh, powers of attraction and possibly his his puissance as well um, and one day he uh, is visited by a, a beautiful young man who says he's called Carlos and he's a university student and they noticed his house that he's just moved into and would he mind storing some books and papers for them and letting them have the occasional study group uh, in his upstairs room or actually out on the balcony and possibly because of the attraction uh, to Carlos um, the Queen of the Corner agrees to this, and uh, it's pretty clear early on that they're not uh, they're not storing books and papers and having study meetings. That they are the uh, Pinochet uh, resistance movement, uh, and I think the uh, the Queen of the Corner knows this or intuits this, but also she's sort of living a fantasy that she and Carlos can can get together. So she's sort of straddling both when she allows herself to fantasise, and they are brilliantly written, her sort of imaginings of them in, uh, together, uh, against when that rubs up against the hard and fast of the situation in Chile outside her front door of a repressive regime. And the chapters are alternated with uh, those given either to Pinochet or his wife, who in this book is hilarious. I don't know what she was like in real life. Um, she has a sort of a starless come personal advisor who not only advises her on fashion and decor for all their various houses, and, uh, but also uh, has opinions on how her husband should look, because he was pretty much always photographed in, in military uniform with dark glasses. And uh, the wife and her stylist think this is a really bad look for Pinochet. And, and those sections, they're, they're, they're very funny, they're very irreverent. Um, uh, but the, the the beauty of the book is is this character, the, the Queen of the Corner, and her fantasies. It's such a sort of elegant to growing old and sort of the melancholy mixed with the sort of rapture of, of fantasies. Will they come true? Is there one last chance for a last dance? It's just so beautifully written. And, and the reason the translator does such a good job is because... Not one sentence in here is wasted. Quite often when a, a, an author writes a sentence that they're quite pleased with, the next sentence sort of goes back, doubles back on it and sort of restates it in a, in a different way, almost to show how pleased the author is with it. Or they feel they haven't quite nailed it in that sentence, they need to double back on it to sort of explain it further. There's none of that in here. Each sentence follows on from its previous sentence and it's seamless, it's frictionless, it's poetic... It's just a beautifully written book about a beautifully, I'd say, observed relationship. But it's a slightly one-sided relationship because there's not much coming back from Carlos. And the Queen of the Corner knows that to some extent she's being used. But she's happy to be used because she's still getting joy and pleasure out of the whole experience. So this is just a wonderful read. Five stars. Will Eve, The Absent Therapist, which is sort of almost... I mean, it's not flash fiction. It is um, sort of snippets of conversation. Uh, sometimes the characters are returned to, uh, but mostly not. And some of those are really insightful, even in the sort of space of 200 words. You know, you get a real sense of who's speaking and, and 
sort of how their mind and their emotions work. But other times there's a lot of sort of fairly bland ones. So I'm just going to read two by way of example. So I have a choice of two dry cleaners. One is called fantasy cleaners, which doesn't inspire confidence. I want to ask, whose fantasy, mine or yours? The other one is Scorpio, just that. Not Scorpio cleaners or Scorpio cleaning. The killer in Dirty Harrow is called Scorpio, isn't he? Row, row, row your boat. Or am I mixing it up with the one with that violent mafia actor, the one who isn't Clint? He's called Scorpio, I think. No, Serpico, there you go. They're both good films anyway. So on the one hand, I really like that uh, because that's how our mind works. It sort of jumps from one association to another that we're not even... You know, this is a very trivial thing about a dry cleaners and the name outside. And then, it hit, you know, the unconscious associations with a couple of films and stuff. So structurally, I like that because it represents how we our minds actually work. But then against that is this. I saw E.T. again the other night. Every time I'm in pieces when we get to the last half hour. Every time. It's like a religious experience. The confusion in the home, the resurrection, the bikes lifting off and flying across the moon. I can't bear it. And I'm suddenly angry, terribly cross. And I go stamping around the room and clapping my hand over my mouth because I realise the neighbours can probably hear. It's because I remember an awful night out with my father when E.T. came out in the 1980s and I was 14. It wasn't cool to like E.T. really, but everyone did. You had, you have no choice. It's a brilliant attack on adolescent cynicism, apart from anything else, because the oldest brother in the film, Elliot's protector, falls in love with E.T. too. Brilliant stroke, that. And Dad just dismissed the whole film out of hand, but with this hatred I'd not seen before. He kept saying, some fucking puppet, some rubbery thing, and pointing out how mawkish the whole enterprise was. And I said, well, have you seen it? And he absolutely went for me. No, I fucking haven't, he said, and I don't fucking want to. So the problem I have with that is, you know, it's it's based around E.T., so in the same way, uh, sorry, in a, it, somehow in a qualitatively different way from the first one of the laundry, of the dry cleaners and the, the mind just sort of idly racing. Here it's much more studied and literary and constructed uh, about an anecdote about a father and a son. Uh, and ultimately it is trivial and sentimental and mawkish because it, it's all based on an analysis of E.T., which I'm sorry, I don't find that as a subject fit for literary meditation um so i gave this three stars i will also say that there's that there's five sections this is divided into five sections all done in the same style the third section all the voices are american or set in america and i you know they deal with race the abortion issue um poverty um but he i don't think he pulls it off i don't know what you know, experience Will Eves has of being in America, living in America, even if he lived there for a couple of years, I don't think it qualified him to try and enter these debates and, and offer stuff up on them. That was that section was entirely unconvincing to me. Three stars. And Anne Quinn passages. So Anne Quinn was a British postmodern author, uh, sort of 50s, 60s, uh, a contemporary B.S. Johnson, of course, one of the few female authors in Britain working in this genre. Um, she wrote four novels in all. The first two, Berg and Three I Have Read, didn't really get on with them. Uh, this is the third, and then I've also started the fourth called Triptychs, which I'm really not getting on with at all. But this is the only one of the four that I really, really like. It has a it's going to be quite hard to sort of nail it down as to why it was successful for me. But basically, it's a woman and a male friend who are occasional uh, lovers. Uh, her brother has disappeared in a Middle Eastern country, uh, which is sort of um, tyrannical and cracking down on communism. Uh, and, you know, the communist resistance to their, their dictatorial government. Uh, and they're passing through one Arab country... Uh, to another in search of this brother uh, they almost don't know what he you know they almost don't seem to know what he looks like so is he a fantasy figure 
Uh, are they really looking for bits of themselves rather than the, the, the brother? So on that level, it's a, you know it's, that's the sort of metaphysical level it works out. But that's not really what's pleasing about this. It's it's four chapters or four sections divided into two different styles. The first style, the first and third are given over to the woman, and she varies between I and she. And the second and fourth are given over to the man, which is a sort of a journal he keeps on their travels. Uh, and which he sort of notates in the margins and things. And I found those much more satisfying than the, the, the woman shifting from I to she. Uh, there is an ambiguity uh, at first when you read it, and it switches from I and then goes into she, you think, oh, this must be the bloke talking about her, but it isn't. It, it's, it's her own sort of uh, uh, lack of or losing that sense of identity that she shifts from herself as, a, as an I to a she or to a her. Um, there's lots, the, the, the man is of Jewish origin and there's lots of interesting sort of Jewish sayings and stuff which I haven't come across before. Uh, I'm also dead impressed that Anne Quinn uh, knows them. Uh, I assume she wasn't Jewish with a name like Anne Quinn, but I could be wrong. Um, so those are impressive. And also there's a lot of, because they're moving through the Middle East or I should say North Africa, where there were sort of lots of Roman and Etruscan sort of forebears. There's lots of artworks uh, and architecture that the man comments on, and those form a, uh, um, a sort of a backdrop for, backdrop for his commentary. Lots of sort of descriptions of, of Greek, you know, the, the images on Greek urns and, and the gods and, uh, and sort of fantasy animals that appear on them, which, again, is peculiarly effective. Uh, it is possible that you would find this book offensive because the man, when he's not um, having sex with her, is having sex with other women. Uh, and, you know, first first she does the same with other men. Um, and it's quite uh, exploitative, his relationships. Uh, it's uh, BDSM. Uh, there's a question of consent uh, of, the, of one of the young women. Is she underage? Um, therefore, is this rape? So it's quite uncomfortable stuff, but you have to remember that this is written by a woman. And that, you know, when a man does it, it's uniformly dodgy. But when a woman is writing about it, and I'm not even saying that these are sort of rape fantasies that Anne Quinn is presenting for herself. I don't think that's the case at all. But it, it puts it on a different footing when a woman has come up with these uh, these image, imagination, this imagine, imagining, sorry, when a woman comes up with the imagining of these sexual scenes of, you know, sort of a woman uh, in, in a sort of um, sexually vulnerable position, uh, it makes it very, very interesting. Um, OK, and just to give you a sample of, of, of what the, the book's like, this is from his journal. What does waking up in this shuttered room mean? Sounds of the city, all is foreign. What am I doing here? What is the point of this laughter, these gestures, this woman whose legs I part? Admit, I find everything strange and foreign. And then a marginal note. She now used him to perform her own tragedy for herself. She finds a metaphor for her condition without defining it. It is my concern for happiness that causes me the most anguish. Another uh, margin note. To make an order out of myth the past. I would like to exhaust the limits of the possible. According to Talmudic legend, 49 of the 50 gates were disclosed to Moses. What then lay behind the last one? So as I say, it's quite hard for me to, to say why this book worked on me so effectively, but it absolutely did. You know, you can't sort of, you know, the plot such as it is, is two people travelling through North Africa, through oppressive regimes, looking for her disappeared brother who may have been captured and or killed as a communist or whatever. That's it. That's the plot. But it's it's the quality of the writing and the meditations in here. So four stars. And finally, you and Morrison, How to Survive Everything. Um, so Haley is a 15 or 16 year old girl, uh, self-proclaimed divorceling, uh, that she and her brother are uh, sort of pawns in the bigger game of their divorced parents. Uh, who are battling it out, using them as pawns, as I say. Um, they are using the, the kids, they are bribing them, making more and more sort of fantastic offers of, of 
reward or they are double binding them um, uh, to such an extent that Haley now feels utterly powerless to be able to make any decision on anything in life because psychologically any decision she makes will leave a disappointed par party. Uh, but there, it, this states that after Covid there is a new pandemic even worse than Covid and uh, the father has sort of been predicting this. So the father has sort of made a, a survivalist camp up in the highlands of Scotland, uh, totally kitted it out and has three or four other people up there. And he kidnaps the kids uh, because he is separated from them. And he kidnaps them and drives them up there and sort of dumps them, uh, you know, in the middle of this community, which is very strange to Haley and her young brother. And, um, you know, obviously... Uh, the mother is is absolutely sort of cr you know, crazy with with you know dread about all of this. Haley manages to get an external phone line. Te you know, uh, tips off her mother. She doesn't know where they are, but she's able to sort of give her mother enough uh, sort of confirmation of what's happened. That the the, the mother uh, is sort of raging that she's going to call the police and stuff. So uh, the father has to sort of, you know, no one must know where this encampment is. So he agrees that he's going to meet the mother sort of halfway. And uh, I can't remember if he says he's going to return the kids or whatever. But anyway, uh, and he ends up abducting her and dumping her in the community. And that's the plot as such. Now, the thing is that, that there are two sides of, of logic uh, at play here. The father is absolutely convinced about this pandemic. And the mother is, says, no, this is more of your sort of paranoid madness. You've been sectioned before. Why are you sort of dragging us all into your sort of complete sort of paranoid fantasies? And the book tries to steer a path whereby you never know which one of them is correct. A bit like Haley's position. She keeps veering from one to the other from this is all, you know, completely sort of uh, illusionary on, on Dad's part to know Dad is the only one who knows what's really happening. Uh, but also, is she siding with her father or is she siding with her mother? And I'm not going to spoil which way it ultimately falls, uh, but I found this all hugely, hugely unsatisfactory. First of all, is the book about a pandemic or is it about uh, how difficult it is to be a divorced child with, with warring parents? Because if it is the latter, and I kind of think it is, how to survive everything is in the title, including divorce. Uh, using the pandemic as a backdrop is in pretty poor taste, really. You know, relegating it to a minor sort of, you know, theatre scenery, you know, a stage flat to play out the real action where we've had so many people who have died. If the father is, is being delusional and this pandemic doesn't exist, that's also very offensive coming so soon on the back of a pandemic that has killed 150,000 plus people in the UK and many more around around the world. So... I found this book really unsatisfactory for both of those scores. One, that it's about the, the personal family dynamics with a, quite an offensive backdrop. And two, that if the father is delusionary, if he's just conjured up all of this pandemic in order to snatch the kids and, and reunite happy and play happy families, again, I find that really offensive. I gave this two stars. And just to finish up, two buddy reads are coming to an end this weekend. One is... Uh, Leanne Shapton's Important Artifacts and Personal Property from the Collection of Leonora Doolan and Harold Morris, including books, street fashion and jewellery. Uh, this is a buddy read with Zena over at Beating Around the Books. And Who Was That Man? A present for Mr Oscar Wilde by Neil Bartlett. And this is a buddy read with Roxy over at A Chaotic Bibliophile. So tomorrow is... Uh, both of those I'll finish today, hopefully. Um... Tomorrow, Saturday, is 1st of May, which means a new month and a new uh, mammoth for me. I haven't decided which one. I'm probably going to go with um, Medusa by Vanessa Place. Uh, so it's been a really good uh, reading uh, month for me. I've read an awful lot of books this month and a lot of very, very good ones. OK, so till next time. Thanks very much.